What's good? What's good? What's good, good people? Welcome to the fifth episode of The Perfect Play. As you all know, as Tim said it before previous week, this is the podcast that teaches you how to make your next move your best move. Yeah, it's, it's a different voice today. I'm Dr. Luda Q, and it feels good to be in this whole seat. So special shout out to my boy Tim, who has been holding us down for the last four weeks. I hope I can fill his shoes. Today is a special day, y'all. We got two special guests who will be rocking with us and dropping some knowledge on today's topic. These two dynamic individuals represent two different coasts, two different mindsets, but one love for the peer forward mission. Uh, So let me set the stage for our first guest. He hails from the City of Angels. He just graduated from UCLA, double major in sociology and Chicano studies. Y'all give it up for Brian. Hey everyone, I'm excited to be on this. I'm looking forward to it. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, now our next guest. She hails from Pretty Girl County. Y'all heard it. Some know it as Prince George's County. She just graduated from the Norfolk State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Mass Communications and that focuses on general broadcasting. We may see her on a tizzle pretty soon. Y'all give it up for Victoria. Victoria, say what's up to the people. Hello, I'm really excited to be here. And yeah, let's get it popping. Yeah, we ready to rock out for the peer leaders. Uh, today, my co-host is my brother in crime. We've been rocking. I called him the other day because I was like, man, we've been rocking this joint for like almost 12 years. It'll be 12 years on a full-time basis, but almost 20 years affiliated with our mission. So y'all give it up for my brother from South Carolina, D.C. Absolutely. What's going on, everybody? Glad to be here. Nevertheless, always the more. It is D.C. Come learn about me. I'm going to be your co-host today. And so we're going to have a fun time being able to come together and learn about what we're going to talk about today. So I believe on today we got this big word that's going to be about persistence. So look out for a little bit more on that today. And then I'm going to pass it over to our phenomenal marketing rep that, I mean, just absolutely hostess with the mostest. She's just amazing. Give it up for AJ, y'all. AJ, let the people know where you at. Hey, everybody. We're back again for this fifth episode, and I'm so glad to be with y'all today. Of course, you know I'm one with the tips and hints, so I definitely got you. We're talking about graduation and all things that you need to celebrate. So stay tuned. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Thanks, man. So DC, man, you know how we do in true peer forward fashion. Yeah. Check in. So what's the check in question for the day, brother? So the check in question for today is the following. So, you know, everybody knows, everybody, you know, they always tell you, that you got to eat, sleep, and then move on. Well, we're going to talk about the eating part today. So I want to know from our special guest, you know, uh, AJ, chime in on this, is what was your favorite college meal? Like, what was that go-to option? And I'm actually going to weigh in first. So I went to the Florida State University, go Seminoles, and my thing was, of course, being, a, you know, considering me a little bit of a country boy from South Carolina, is I love that home-cooked meal. And so randomly, I found out there was this chain restaurant called Boston Market. And so whenever I felt a little homesick, I just pop on over to Boston Market, get me that good turkey, that mac and cheese, those green beans, and a sweet tea, man. That just made life so wonderful for me. So to our special guest, to AJ, let me know, what was that favorite college meal you guys had? Oh, you know, I'm repping Georgetown all day. And at Georgetown, we had a little special something, something called Chicken Finger Thursdays. And I know what y'all thinking, like, Chicken Fingers, that's whatever, you get that anywhere. But something about the Chicken Fingers on Georgetown's campus were super special. You know, they would dip them in a sauce for you. You can make your own sauce. It was just everything. It was definitely my favorite part of the week. So Chicken Finger Thursdays, Chicken Fingers with fries, that's it. So to our lovely special guests, you know, Brian, Victoria, where's that college meal that you guys enjoyed? Hmm. This is a very interesting question because my answer is sort of a, 
it's it's kind of a, a meme or a joke on, on campus for all for our community. I don't know if it's 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 sort of it has like a love hate relationship with students. Um, it's not just necessarily like a play. Uh, it's it's a dining hall, but the thing about the UCLA dining halls is they're rated amongst like the best um, in the nation. So like our food is always really good, but there's this one place. Um, it's called B Plate, and it's sort of a mix um, of like modern take on food, but they try to make it really healthy. So everything's like um, sourced the day of. So like you literally see them bring in like the greens and everything that they have. Um, so it's not, none of the traditional like pizza and uh, you know chicken tenders kind of like cafeteria food. It's like these like flatbreads with like basil on them and like this they're like kind of bougie and all that and <laughs> yeah so so like they make this joke of like how they hate it but really everyone loves it because you're getting like delicious food but you don't pack on those extra 15 pounds ah so you get yeah. the taste without the waste That's exactly so, um, the waste. so yeah. I, I like that brian i like that yeah so that that was that was what kind of a go to for me, just trying to stay healthy, but also trying to like, you know, get a good meal and and something tasty. So um, yeah, kind of missing it right now, but I got you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that, Brian. Victoria, what you got for us? Pretty Girl County. East All Street. right. So Norfolk State University is literally my favorite place in the world because the calf may not be rocking every day but we have a diner on campus oh. that has like that's a I, that gives us ihop vibes and hibachi vibes oh. and my go-to meal especially if i still have my dining dollars on my card is the chicken hibachi with extra yum yum sauce wow wow Okay, so help me understand this, Victoria. So is it like they actually cook it hibachi style where you're like, you guys sitting down and you watching them set it up for you? Yes, like Ooh. it's, it's there right in front of us. They have the whole, the hat, like you're at a hibachi spot. It is really cool. And wow. that was probably the newest, that um, they built that, they turned the old calf into that, um, last in 2017 so my second semester freshman year got you so it's bougie but on a budget bougie on a budget got you okay okay so we got taste with no waste and bougie on a budget okay i'm not mad at it. i'm not mad at that that's what's up that's what's up well i appreciate you guys kind of checking in for us and so i'm gonna pass it back over to dr lou to q to take us into what we're going to get into on today Man, y'all talk y'all took me back to like my ramen noodle days, man. So uh that was my go to meal. Um, you know, it was just what I could afford, but it got me through. So thanks, DC, for allowing us to check check in. You know, um surviving college is really um the topic of today, dog. So in this episode of the perfect play, we we're gonna be talking about persistence. The word is at the top of my brain because it's what we live in our mission and we breathe it. Yeah. We talk about it consistently. Um, I'm researching it currently. Um, but for the people, um, persistence simply is defined as successfully matriculating through your college studies, semester after semester, through completion. That's, you know, people define it a lot of different ways, but I want to keep it simple for our listeners. Hey, and Dr. Ludic, is could you also say, you know, to keep it in layman's terms, that's keeping it pushing me, keeping it moving semester after semester. Would that be, you know, equivalent as well? Keeping it moving, keeping it, keeping it going. Got to keep on keeping on. <laughs> indeed, um, indeed. And, the, and the reason why that's important, because a lot of us don't finish. For example, I was reading an article last night where the, the researcher said that First generation students, so a lot of the students that we typically work with, who comes from families where, and so let me define what a first generation student is first, right? So first yeah, generation is that particular student who's the first generation and their family, meaning that their parents didn't go to college. So 
if you have an older brother that went to college, older sister, you're still a first generation student because generationally you all are the first to kind of take that step. And so what the study said that almost half of new students attending community colleges do not persist. So that means a lot, there's, there's nearly half of us that start college that don't complete it, which is a big problem because for students who's never been through the process, they don't know how to survive college, right? That's right. Um, so we have to figure out what the solutions are if we're going to change the narrative of the communities that we serve. And so it's real important that we get new advice because I think what got us through through our years in Tallahassee and so forth has changed. I mean, we've been out of school for the past, you know, I can say, but we've been out of school for a long time. So it's important that our guests speak to the people and talk about how they're surviving and graduating college. So my first question to our guests is, what were your first steps? Like literally, your first steps when you got to college, what, what, how did, what was your mindset? Like how did you know that you were going to get through the process? What was your plan for college survival? Well, for me, um, I was going to school three hours away from home, and I knew nobody, literally nobody. So first thing I wanted to do was establish a good relationship with my roommate. So I got to campus um, on moving day. I got to campus before my roommate. So my mom gave me, like, a note card or a piece of paper, or I grabbed a piece of paper from somebody. And I wrote, like, a nice little note for my roommate in case she moved in while me and my family were gone. And I wanted to, like, establish a good relationship with her and just let her know that I'm a nice person and that this could be a great year if we, you know, just making that step to at least establish one good relationship. Because I know that if I'm going to be in this room with someone for the next year, um, I want my year in that room to be speak and span great vibes only so um that was like my first step thanks for sharing brian i think my my first step was kind of not knowing really what what to do because i i've had the privilege of going to school close to home but at the same time it's such a different environment and it's it's just so huge of a campus and there's so many students um, so I, I, I didn't know anyone, like I actually didn't know anyone. I showed up, um, to this seven story building, having to move in. Um, the interesting thing is as soon as I moved in, they had this, I don't know if they have it now, but they had this thing where you would have a um, volunteer day and they would have all of the incoming freshmen put in a bus and we would go out to like, um, either like beaches or like middle schools uh, across LA and we would do like painting or we would do like cleaning up the beach or something like that with our respected halls. So I was put in a, uh, what's called a living learning community. So it was um, the Chicano floor on our, um, the second floor of the building I was in and all of the students got packed into one bus. Um, We didn't know each other or anything. And we went to a uh, school and we painted the backboards like different NBA colors and stuff like that. So, and I still have the picture actually from, from that. Um, so I guess my first step was actually taken by the university themselves in an attempt to like help people establish a connection early on. Um, Cause otherwise I probably would have just locked myself in my room knowing how I am. But that, I mean, that allowed me like, at least to get out and like meet some people and stuff like that. Thanks. Thanks. I think, I think you all gave a lot for the people to consider. The second question I want to pose to the panel is like, what really, if you were to think about it, what was the one thing that, what's the one thing that made you successful? And what I'm looking for is the tricks of the trade for surviving college. Like what, what made you successful? Now, Right, my professor is my best friend because one thing that I knew 
um, going into college. Well, one thing that I didn't know, but I kind of knew going into college was that I could pick my own classes or pick my own times um, hey, for class. Sorry, and I, and I didn't mean to cut you off. There may be listeners here that don't know. You just, I, I remember this even during my college time. Can you let them know what rate my professor is? Because there may be some listeners that don't know. Okay. So ratemyprofessor.com is basically a website that allows you to see each professor's rating according to the students that have taken that, that professor's class. So, for example, if you, for, for me as a mass comm major, I had to take a media theory class or even things that are not in my major, so like a biology course different electives, I would go to rate my professor and in the applying for classes process, I would go to rate my professor, search each professor. And if a professor has a five or a four, maybe a three, um, those are considered good versus like a one, two, zero, saying that those professors are not the easiest or not the, uh, are the hardest or the least understanding is what I would, you know, what I would look for, a professor who's not understanding of situations and, and stuff like that. So I would go to rate my professor. I would search up my professors. If my professor has a three or above, then I would apply for their course because I believe mm-hmm. that I would be more successful in that course. And um, in addition, I would also I would also make sure that I was best friends with my advisor. Me and my advisor would talk, would have um, one-on-one time just to make sure that I'm going, I'm matriculating through school as not easy, as smooth as possible. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, smooth. Because easy does not always mean, easy is not always the best route, but smooth, having professors that will challenge you or um, would look out for you in certain situations, especially for me. Yeah, I just I just wanted to make sure that whatever I did through school, what, whatever courses I took, I was able to perform my best in those courses or at least learn something. If I didn't perform my best, then I'll learn something from that professor and move on and be able to become a better human being. And uh, make sure that your freshman year is your best year, because if it wasn't for my freshman year, my GPA now trying to apply for grad school. I don't think I would have the GPA that I have now. But freshman year, making sure that you buckle down that year and make it your best year because as you go through college, it's just getting harder. It's just going to get harder. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's some good That's some good stuff right there. I, I appreciate that. Brian, you got anything you want to uh, drop, some, drop some knowledge on us, give us a little bit more tips and tricks of the trade? Yeah, I would say um, for college, it, it's kind of a, a tricky thing like how to survive college, it's kind of a tricky subject because there's not like one specific way to survive college and what works for one person might not work for uh, someone else. So I do agree though that um, your freshman year is extremely important. It's sort of, I feel like if you can get past your freshman year, you have a higher possibility of, of graduating just because you've your freshman year, everything's so new and, you know, you're taking these classes with so many students. And if you, I feel like if you can get past your freshman year, um, you'll be set. But um, I know for me, my freshman year wasn't easy. Like the transitioning was hard and I I did struggle to like find a group and all that. So, so, so Brian, can you actually double click on that a little bit? I really want to make sure our listeners kind of understand that, Like you just mentioned, which I thought was a really powerful point, that there's no one way to complete college. And I think that's something that everybody needs to take away. But then also that it was a struggle finding that community. So what was, can you talk a little bit more about that struggle? And then, you know, how did you ultimately, you know, overcome that or be able to resolve it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, if I would talk to some of my friends and told, told them, how, how did you get through like college? Their answers would all be pretty different because there's, there's actually no one way. Some, some people do some people, a lot, a lot of things that they do is they try to socialize as much as possible their freshman year. So like find groups of students that have similar interests. Um, I tried to do that. Like I, I, started doing a uh, wushu which is like a performance martial arts that would do competitions and stuff like that but i just i didn't find my place and i think that kind of discouraged me from like trying other things 
Mm. And so then I kind of got lost in, in the crowd where I was just going to classes and then going back to my room doing homework and not really experiencing like the college life. Um, a lot of people like to like, you know, go out and have fun, stuff like that. That's with their friends. My issue was like, I was new and I'm not the kind. So I guess this applies, my story would apply to those people who are kind of, you know, they don't participate as much or they're on the mm -hmm. quieter side. I would, I would definitely say find something, like try a bunch of different things. Find something that you like and find a group of students that are part of, of something that you want to be a part of. So you have something to look forward to. That in it of itself is a, a distraction away from your studies and it'll help you feel like you have an actual place on campus. And so, Brian, can you tell us a little bit about the group that you found that you really found yourself enjoying? Yeah, it took me, it took me probably until my junior year to find this group. Um, I actually tried applying to it my second year um, as an actor for the showcase, uh, fortunately I got sick and then I missed uh, auditions, but I did apply for the board of uh, the organization. It's called the Latinx Film and Theater Association, uh, wow. which is an org that produces uh, student produced, student written, student acted, everything is student made. Um, a showcase in May uh, that displays actual written works of, uh, uh, plays made by students, directed by students, acted out by students. And the whole production is actually made by students. Like they take care of the financing, the booking the plays, the booking, uh, all of the things that you need, the little logistical stuff. And mm -hmm. we also put on a um, film festival where we get submissions from like Latin America and South America, South America. It's just uh, this whole thing that we did our, as a, just a student, uh, student collective. And that really interested me. I, I joined, I wanted to write and ended up do, uh, doing like the bike behind the scenes kind of thing. And I mean, I got to lead it this year, uh, which has been, a, it's just a crazy, it literally feels like I have a second job if I'm being on it <laughs> for my studies. Gotcha. Wow, that's what's up. That is really awesome. And just being able to find that community and being able to be immersed in it, definitely I can just hear from uh, just the way you spoke about it that that really meant a lot. Um, I want to kick it over to Victoria really quick. Um, just really quickly, maybe even like, you know, a uh, 60 second piece. You talked about an advisor and how that advisor really helped you. Um, can you just kind of talk through just what was that experience with your advisor? And maybe even if you also had a financial aid advisor that you worked with, what was that experience like and how did that help you persist? Well, um, on campus, when I came into Norfolk State University, um, they appointed me an advisor to basically help me create my schedule, plan out my years, my years at Norfolk State, and just basically give me advice and just be a safe haven for me um, ac academically. Through my years, I've had a few because Norfolk State was going through some changes, but I, I love their new change. I love their recent change, which is they'll give you an advisor. Your, they'll give you an advisor from our Student Success Center, and that will be your advisor for your freshman and sophomore year. And then your junior year, it will be a professor in your department. So I feel like my junior year, once I had that professor in my department um, guiding me through his coworkers, it was it was like having that inside play on what professors are really thinking about each other and what professor really is there to see you flourish. And even though you would think that all your professors are there to see you flourish and see you grow, some professors are just, some professors are just not, or may not be that professor for you mm. as the type of student that you are. I feel like that was, that helped me a lot understanding understanding people and not just professors but understanding people and that certain people are just not your cup of tea and then as far as a financial aid advisor I really didn't have a financial aid advisor mainly because the financial aid department at Norfolk State University is a one of a kind and I was better um going to my mentor who was actually an admissions counselor who worked in the admissions office when I was feeling 
many cases where I didn't have enough money to continue in school. I knew that um, if I was to call her or if I was to text her, that she would be that advisor that I need in a sense and helping me finding more money or finding um, a job on campus that will help me be able to pay for school. And if it wasn't for her, I feel like I probably would have left Norfolk State um, a lot sooner because being an out-of-state student can be very straining on your pockets and then the loans can get out of hand. So I really was trying to make sure that at the end of the day that I knew that I was going to get loans because I love going to Norfolk State, but I didn't want it to be, I didn't want to become a a statistic Mm. with those loans. So I tried hard to make sure that with that relationship that I had in admissions, making sure that it flowed smoothly to financial aid and now graduating. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I really do appreciate that, Victoria. Just being able to utilize those relationships, even when particularly certain areas, you may not have it, there are areas that you do, and being able to make that work. Dr. Ludic I definitely want to tap you back in, my brother, because I know there are a couple other uh, pieces that you want to be able to have us talk about. Yeah, thanks, DC. Um, so the last question I want to ask my panel is because, you know, persistence a lot of it impacts first-generation students. And as a first-generation student like myself in D.C., that meant that our, we didn't have any solid advice from back home. Couldn't nobody tell us how to survive college because they have never been through the process. So for my, my panelists, real quickly, what were your expectations for your parents um, through your college process? And if you could answer that in like in a minute, unless that would be helpful for our audience? Well, um, my mom and dad are both born and raised Nigerian. My dad did come to school here, but he was a lot older. And then my mom um, attended Bowie State, but she attended Bowie State with me and my sister. So she wasn't the traditional college student as well. So for me, going into school, I... My parents really didn't have any advice that they could give me about handling college. They just told me to try my best my first year. And that's why I I deem my freshman year very important because not only did my mom say, my parents say it, but um, one of my mentors when I was going into school made a very big point that it's really important to start your freshman year off as strong as possible, as strong as you can do. Because... Things are going to happen. Life, life happens. So it is really important that when life happens, you still you have that foundation to keep you strong and keep you down and keep you grounded. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I answered the question. No, you did spot on, spot on. Absolutely. Ryan, 45 seconds or less, can you answer the same question? Yeah. Um, for me, I have to be completely honest. It, it's, it's probably zero. Mm-hmm. My parents, um, my parents don't even speak English properly. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm always helping them with everything um, regarding like emails and phone calls and stuff like that. So they literally couldn't give me any advice. And, and even if even if it was in Spanish, I mean, to put it simply, my own advisors from high school had trouble helping me with college applications. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. But um, I, I guess it was a little bit different for like undocumented students. So, I, I mean, it just adds another layer of difficulty. So, yeah, I mean, they, they really couldn't help me with that. I had to figure it out on my own. Thanks for sharing, Brian. Uh, so, apparently, this hopefully we highlighted some of the elements of why persistence is um, a really big issue today, nowadays, especially for community college and higher education researchers is because we know that first generation students, they are at a disadvantage. You heard our panelists and I can even attest from my own experience being in college humbled me. I had to ask for help. So hopefully we highlighted the importance of asking for help to the people that's on the college campuses and making sure you establish connections to help you get you through. You cannot do this alone but also advocate for yourself. You know what you need. And I'm going to tell you, on every college campus, there's somebody that can help you get to 
what you need or help you get your needs met. Um, but we have to go out and be brave and get the help we need. So I know we had some questions from peer leaders that came in. DC, what, what we got, man? Yeah, so we actually, uh, this segment is called You Ask, We Answer. And so what we do is we try to get questions from our peer leaders from across the nation. But Peer Forward, we definitely are all across the nation and being able to hear from you uh, the various questions you may have. And so uh, Tyree Bell from Charles Flowers High School over in Prince George's County, Maryland, um, had the following question. What are some tips when it comes to balancing your student life and your college workload? Now, this is a question that I get asked a lot, not only um, because of, you know, you're in college, but I work, I was a resident assistant in a freshman building. So freshmen always come up and ask this particular question. And the best way to answer it is um, prioritizing. You have to know which is important, what is important, and what is not important or what can be on the back burner. I know for myself that I need to do, if I don't do my schoolwork when I first get it, or if I don't do my schoolwork as soon as like I at least, at least attempt to start it as soon as I get the assignment, I'm going to forget about it. And then life happens, things happen and you, and now it's, now <laughs> it's 24 hours before it's due. So now you have to rush to get it done. And that's not, and that's honestly not the best way to live. You see kids talk about it all the time or students talk about it all the time on social media. Like, well, it's 1130 and I have an assignment due at 1159. And that's not fun. That is, honestly is not fun at all. It may be funny to joke about, but at the end of the day, you're stressing yourself out beyond what you need to do. So prioritizing what is important. Um, maybe I can't go to this event because I need to make sure I do this now or I'm going to go late to this event so I can do this now. It's mm. not, it doesn't mean you have to shut out everybody. It just means that you create time for everything. You can create time and allot the right amount of time for everything. Got you, got you. So literally being able to have your time set aside in the unique buckets for where you need them is how we prioritize and balance that out. Thank you so much. So what I want to do now is I want to actually pass it over to AJ as we have another segment that we call Tips and Hints. And so, Miss AJ, if you'll take it away. Absolutely. So I know a lot of y'all are heading towards graduations. Even our special guests are two almost graduates of Norfolk University and UCLA. And so we want to just find out ways for everyone to be able to celebrate graduation and to make sure that this moment is still momentous to all those who worked hard for four years, whether it's in high school or in college. So we're coming at you today. Our tips and hints are three ways to celebrate your graduation at home. So our first way we wanna go ahead and get into it is creating a playlist. I know high school and college music definitely helped me through the songs that you party to, the songs that you study to, the songs that make you feel like someone understands what you're going through. Making a playlist is a great way to capture those moments and to capture the past four years. So go ahead, think through what songs made you you over these past four years and put them in a playlist. Share it wide and proud and show everyone, get your friends involved, what helped you get through these times. Another one, our tip number two, is to decorate your graduation cap. Um, although a lot of us may be stuck at home, you still could have access to materials that you could easily make into a graduation cap. Just a little bit of cloth and some cardboard from a box, and you can make your own graduation cap. There are plenty of tips online on how to decorate those. Definitely check out Pinterest for new ideas, but your decorated graduation cap is a way of showing everyone what was important to you in your time on campus or at school. Make sure that you take plenty of pics and that you share it wide on your social media as well. And speaking of social media, our last one is to just celebrate with your friends on IG Live. So if you want to toss a cap, if you want to, you know, play some songs and invite your friends into your IG Live, if you just want to celebrate with everyone on a Zoom call, just take some time for yourself and plan something out so that y'all can all celebrate together. It's a great way to come together and to make sure that you're, you're taking the time to celebrate the way that you want to and with the people that you want to celebrate with. 
Be sure to invite your family since they've been cheering you on for these past few years and to absolutely invite your friends because they've made these moments what they are. And I know a couple of us have definitely leaned on support from our friends during these past four years. So yeah, be sure that you just take the time to celebrate the great accomplishment that's coming to you. This is a huge milestone. And so absolutely just take the time to make it what it can be, to make it everything that you want it to be. Ooh, ooh, thank you, AJ. Man, this has been a, um, a wonderful podcast. Um, persistence is uh, a topic that is near and dear to me, as I said earlier. It's, it's all about helping our peer leaders finish. A lot of us start the process, but it's sad to say that we don't finish the process because we don't ask for help. The number one reason why we don't persist is because we do not ask for help, peer leaders. So I'm, I'm telling you as somebody who has been through the process three different times, I could not do this if I didn't ask for help. You know what I'm saying? So as I complete my doctoral journey, my hope is that whenever you all start, you finish the process. Keep your eyes on the prize. Mamba mentality forever. So special shout out to AJ and DC for another successful episode. My colleagues can do this work without you. But most importantly, Victoria and Brian. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Ooh. Expertise, share your knowledge, and congratulations on your newfound success. Um, I wish the best for you in your future endeavors. Peer leaders, share this episode with your peers, your families, your loved one. It's a good conversation, a good conversation starter. It's something that I hope will give, will plant the seeds for you all to continue and stay motivated to complete the process. Well, mama, we made it because we're on Apple and Spotify. I'm your host, Dr. Luda Q. We'll see you next time. The perfect place.